my name is Torrance Burke. I'm part of Team 2 along with Dominic Cole, Jennifer Connolly, and Colton Meyer. Our project is the crystallization of sugar. Essentially, we supersaturate water with sugar and cool the solution down to precipitate crystals out of it. And then we'll remove the crystals and perform measurements. Our objectives were first to gather info and perform research on how crystallization happens and find necessary equations for our predictions and then to develop an operating procedure to perform our experiments and gather data. After that, we would perform calculations on our data and find ways to optimize our experiment in order to produce the desired result. If we look at the theory behind crystallization, it seems to break the second law of thermodynamics because we are going from a less order, the liquid solution, into a more order of a crystal. What happens is if we look at delta G, equals delta H minus T delta S, what ha the crystal, when the, bonds, uh, when the bonds are formed and we create solid crystal structures, the reaction releases, temp releases energy to increase the temperature of the right side of the equation, therefore making it more of a negative Gibbs free energy. If we now look at primary nucleation, primary nucleation is when the first crystal is formed in the crystallization st structure. And then the secondary nucleation is when the formation of crystals form on top of the already made crystals. We usually speed this up in industry by introducing a nucleation site, and in this case, a chopstick dipped in sugar to already have crystals on it to speed up the process. And now if we look at the equilibrium constant, it varies highly with temperature. So that means if we increase the temperature, we can increase the equilibrium constant, and by the Chatelier's principle, we can dissolve more sugar in the water. And that is how we achieve a supersaturated solution when we heat it up. And with the efficiency, how to measure efficiency of how much we crystallize, we measure the mass of the crystallized solution divided by the initial mass to, times 100 to get the percent of the solution crystallized. Crystallization follows three steps. The first step is clustering. As you can see by the first picture here, the crystals are starting to form on top of the, of the chopsticks and clustering together, kind of making a galaxy effect. The next step is nucleation. We are introducing a nucleation site into the solution, which is the chopstick dipped in sugar. And when we put that into our mother liquor, it starts the secondary nucleation process. From there, the last picture is we, the crystals start growing on top of the other crystals, and we see a very cloudy solution, and that's how we create our solid mass of crystals. In the industrial setting, crystallization is used primarily to recover high purity products. In the pharmaceutical industry, it's used for active pharmaceutical ingredients, or APIs. The fertilizer industry, it's used often to recover products like urea. And in the wastewater industry, it's used for recovering of phosphates. As you can see in the bottom, the pictures right here, there is a schematic for a crystalliza crystallization process, as well as a picture of what it looks like in industry. As was stated earlier, the KSP often varies with temperature, especially in the case of sugar. These are just some numbers to go along with what was talked about earlier. You can see that at 20 degrees, the KSP for sugar is roughly 200 grams of sugar per 100 milliliters of water. When you increase the temperature of the water to 100 degrees, that jumps up to nearly 500. So a lot more sugar can be dissolved in the higher temperature water. Therefore, when you cool the sugar from that 100 degrees to 20 degrees, you should yield about 300 grams of sugar in the form of crystals. Some of the various measurements we performed were measurements of mass of the crystal, uh, the crystallization speed, how long it took to form, the efficiency, which is how much sugar we actually got out versus what we put in, and the temperature required to obtain the crystals, which varied from trial to trial. Here we have a temperature versus time graph for trials two, three, and four. As you can see, around the 50 to 60 minute mark for trials two and three, and around the 20 minute mark for trial four, there's a slight bump in the temperature. This is caused by the exothermic reaction of forming the bonds associated with crystallization. This occurs because as the temperature begins to drop during cooling, Le Chatelier's principle states that it tries to maintain equilibrium and increase the temperature. The only way it has to do this is by forming bonds. As can be seen from these two graphs of massive crystal formed and efficiency of crystallization, our first trial was our best. After this, we attempted to manipulate variables such as agitation 
amount of sugar put in and cooling rates, and we were never able to produce the same result. Some of the challenges our group experienced during our experiments were finding a consistent cooling rate. This is because our ice bath was not quite as sophisticated as we would have liked it to be. Another challenge was measuring temperature due to the thermometer causing agitation and potential nucleation. This messed with our results more than we would have liked. Another challenge was the reliability of crystallization. The first time we performed the trial, we had great success, but we were never able to produce the same results. Another challenge was what's known as confectioner's napalm, which is the sticky substance before the crystallization. If it gets on your skin, it will burn you, and so we wore protective clothing and goggles during transfer. The final challenge was the crystallization time frame, with the whole reaction taking upwards of three hours each trial and difficulty scheduling that much time. Everyone, my name is Cole Meyer, and today we'll be showing you how to do the crystallization of sugar. So the first step is you grab a one cup measuring cup, and you can take a scoop of regular table sugar. We bought ours from one cup, and we're going to measure it on the scale. And we come to a mass of 226 grams for every cup of sugar, and we're going to put that into our massive beaker for our experiment. For this experiment, we're going to be using five cups of sugar to one cup of water, and we're going to be using DI water. The next step we're going to do is we're going to take one cup of DI water, and we'll also measure the mass. We will then use this in our sugar solution. Now that we have our sugar solution, looking at the solution, you can see it's very well not dissolved yet. You can very well see the crystals in the, in the water solution here. It's very thick and it's not clear at all. As we heat up the solution and we have it stirring, we'll hopefully see the sugar start dissolving when the solution becomes clear. So now, after five minutes has passed, we're going to keep stirring the solution. The solution is becoming a lot more thinner as we are dissolving more sugar in the water. The equilibrium constant is directly dependent on temperature of the solution. As we increase temperature, we can increase the equilibrium constant and therefore dissolving more sugar in the solution. So as you can see, our solution is clearing up right before your eyes. The sugar is dissolving inside the solution as we're increasing the temperature. This is starting to become a supersaturated solution. When the sugar is all dissolved, the solution will be nice and clear. The temperature for this is around 110 degrees Celsius. And this is what we call the syruping point. Now most of the sugar has dissolved and we're about 110 degrees Celsius. So now what we have done is we've transferred our sugar solution from the hot plate into a cooling bath. What we're trying to do here is limit the amount of time needed for crystallization. We will lower the temperature to 70 degrees Celsius and then we'll remove it from the cooling bath and insert our nucleation site to begin the crystallization process. So the next step is to take the solution and we're going to create the nucleation site. The nucleation site is the point where we dip this chopstick into our solution and roll it in the sugar. What this will do is create uh, a point where the sugar can grow onto previous sugar crystals, also decreasing the time. This is a very common practice in industry and this is also what we're going to do in our experiment. You got to be careful with this solution though. They call it convectors name pump because it's so hot and because it's a lipid sugar solution, when you put it on your skin, it's very resistant to water. So if you get this on your skin, it will burn and when you try to wash it off, it's not going to come off as easily as other materials. So here we go. We're going to dip this in the sugar solution. Get that all covered in it. And I'll get off the access, excess. 
And now we're going to roll this in some other sugar molecules and create the activation site. Alright, that's pretty well covered to me. So now we're going to take our nucleation site, we're going to put it back in the solution, tighten this guy up, and now we wait for the hardest part of our experiment, is waiting. After removing the crystal from the mother liquor, this is how it looks. Right now I am draining the mother liquor from the crystal using gravity. And what we'll do after this step is crush up the crystals and get a mass. And from this mass, we will use this to use that mass to calculate the efficiency of how much we were able to crystallize. We hope you enjoyed our crystallization experiment. We hope to see you again soon. Thank you.